important to both of you, but it's conceivable that you would have um, occupied a Jammu Baraka's position as vice presidential nominee if you got the deal you were trying to cement with Bernie Sanders to be top of the ticket of the Green Party um, once he lost the Democratic Party nomination. What happened there? Well, you know, it was um, it was an offer that we made to Sanders that let's sit down and talk. Let's collaborate, because this is an incredibly historic moment. He had an incredibly historic campaign um, that really uh, unveiled uh, how much momentum there is for deep change here. Um, not that we aligned completely, especially around foreign policy and on issues of student debt and so on. There was some distance between us. But he was beginning to move in our direction. And we said, let's sit down and let's explore how we can collaborate, and we could bring this to the Green Party convention, because, as a candidate, I obviously couldn't couldn't say, here, Bernie will be our nominee, any more than I could say I would be our nominee. It's up to the delegates. But if we saw eye to eye, and if Bernie came to understand why it is that we need an independent third-party politics, why you cannot have a revolutionary campaign <coughs> inside of a counter-revolutionary party that essentially sabotaged Bernie's campaign in so many ways, as we saw from the email revelations, from the very fact of the superdelegates that took decision-making out of the hands of a democratic process. Uh, you know, Did you ever speak gonna... to Bernie Sanders we about this? We tried many times. Um, I was uh, Meaning able we, to get— Meaning we, mean you tried. I tried. The Not... Green Party tried. Mm -hmm. uh, we had many p people trying for us. We had uh, emails that were delivered to him and that we know did get into his hands. But, you know, Bernie said from the start he was in this uh, to basically support and continue building the Democratic Party. Um, he has— <laughs> ironically, not been a supporter of independent third parties, although nominally he's been one, but he doesn't believe in actually standing up and challenging power uh, in an electoral way. And I think there's a generational difference between Bernie and his vision of the Democrats as the party of the New Deal and a younger generation that sees the Democrats as the party of war, Wall Street, uh, drone attacks. Although he certainly mobilized them, uh, Jammu Baraka, from outside and inside this country. What is your assessment watching Bernie Sanders and his campaign? Where or do you agree? Where do you differ? I think that Bernie Sanders was responsible for really broadening the conversation here in this country. There's no, there's no doubt about that. Um, we were concerned, though, that the, uh, the silence on the foreign policy issues was, was troubling, uh, because we understood that the, the American people were ready for real change. And we wanted Bernie Sanders to understand that he didn't have to embrace the aggressive policies of the Obama administration. He didn't have to embrace the, the drone warfare. He didn't have to be silent on, on, on uh, the Saudis and Yemen. Um, so we had some some concerns, but we know that there are young people who were very committed to this this revolution, and many of them have come over to 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 the Green Party, and more I think are considering. If they, I think when they see that we're serious about this, and we're serious about really uh, 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 continuing this political revolution, uh, I think that uh, from outside the country, people see that the only alternative for real progressive politics in the U.S. is in fact the Green Party. And they see that there is real opportunity for us to expand the democratic process in this country, and they support it. I wanted to go um, back to the Democratic Convention, when Juan Gonzalez and I hosted a debate between the Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Chris Hedges, used to be with The New York Times, and former Labor Secretary Robert Reich about the presidential race. Hedges um, has endorsed um, the Green Party ticket, the two of you. Uh, Robert Reich is now backing Hillary Clinton after endorsing Bernie Sanders during the primaries. This is what the former Labor Secretary Reich had to say. I'm just saying that your conscience needs to be aware uh, that if you do not support Hillary Clinton, you are increasing the odds of a true, clear and present danger to the United States, a menace to the United States. Uh, and you're increasing the possibility that there will not be a progressive movement, there will not be anything we believe in uh, in the future, because the United States will really be changed for the worse. Uh, that's not a—that's not a— 
uh, a, a risk I'm prepared to take at this point in time. I'm going to move. I'm going to do exactly what I've been doing uh, for the last 40 years. I'm going to continue to beat my head against the wall to build and contribute to building a progressive movement. Uh, the day after uh, Election Day, I am going to try to work with Bernie Sanders and anybody else who wants to work in strengthening a third party. And again, maybe it's the Green Party uh, for the year 2020 and do everything else I was just talking about. But right now, as we lead up to Election Day 2016, I must urge everyone who is listening or who is watching to do whatever they can to make sure that Hillary Clinton is the next president and not Donald Trump. That is Labor Secretary Robert Reich, who supported Bernie Sanders, but now is supporting Hillary Clinton. Dr. Jill Stein. Well, you know, I mean, it's one thing to say that in the future we will build a party of resistance, uh, and another, you know, to say, well, we just can't do it now, you know, because when is this going to get better? You know, we've been uh, really in a race to the bottom between two corporate parties that enable each other to continue moving to the right. And uh, it's not going to get better unless we make it get better. This politics of fear has basically delivered everything that we are afraid of, all the reasons people are told to vote for the lesser evil, because you didn't want the expanding wars, you didn't want the meltdown of the climate, the massive Wall Street bailouts, the attack on immigrants. That's exactly what we've gotten. The answer, you know, to this crisis and this right-wing extremism is to stand up with a truly progressive agenda, and we have to fight for that. If we're ever going to get out of this mess, we need to begin building our power now. Well, Donald Trump visited a Milwaukee suburb, West Bend, on Tuesday, where he called for more police to patrol low-income communities. His visit came only days after the uprising in Milwaukee, sparked by the fatal police shooting of 23-year-old African-American Silville Smith. Trump spoke in front of an overwhelmingly white audience in West Bend, Wisconsin, which is about 95 percent white. The problem in our poorest communities is not that there are too many police. The problem is that there are not enough police. More law enforcement, more community engagement, more effective policing is what our country needs desperately. Just like Hillary Clinton is against the minors, she is against the police, believe me. So that's Donald Trump. In fact, it was billed as his appeal to the African-American community, yes. uh, Jammu Baraka. Um, they said next he'll be appealing to the Latino community. So far, his support um, sort of floats between 0, 1 and 2 percent support in the African-American community. Your response to what he said? Well, you said? know, that's—we that's, that's, uh, can't afford those kind of appeals, because that was basically uh, an appeal to, to neo-fascism. That was an appeal to his, his base. It was an appeal that said, basically, the only way we— we can be safe, that is, uh, white folks, is to make sure that we have uh, those, black, those dangerous black people under full control, that any kind of oppositional activity, any kind of expressions of, of, of resistance has to be crushed by the state. So we understand his, 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 his game, uh, and he won't be successful. It's clear about that. But he is, he is playing with some very dark forces here in this country, and that's why people are concerned. That's why they are fearful. And that's, that's the uh, weapon that the Democrats have used to hurry people back onto the Democratic plantation. But as Dr. Dr. Stein just said, you know, we can—we're we, not afraid of, of Donald Trump, Trump or anybody else, because, you know, what? We, we believe in the ability of the American people to, to, to resist, to defend democracy. So we say, when do we begin to confront these right-wing forces? Because every four years, they're going to have someone to, to present that's going to scare many, many people. But you know what? If those scary individuals are, are confronted by an organized and determined uh, electorate, an organized and determined people, we're not going to be concerned about that. Uh, earlier this week, Donald Trump repeated his call for immigration to be suspended from parts of the world and for new ideological tests for all immigrants. Mm -hmm. In the Cold War, we had an ideological screening test. The time is overdue to develop a new screening test for the threats we face today. I call it extreme vetting.
Dr. Jill Stein, extreme vetting. He talked about vetting for people who criticize the Constitution um, or express bigotry. Thought police is what he's talking about. Let's exercise thought police over people coming into this country. Next step will be thought police uh, over people who are in this country already. And, you know, the, the idea that we could control terrorism by uh, exercising thought police over people coming in is preposterous when, you know, when it's people here as well, you know, who are subject to being radicalized and uh, becoming extremists because their lives are miserable, because they've been locked out of society. You know, as Ajamu was saying, uh, we are an organized resistance. We are a different way forward. We don't need to simply um, you know, sit in terror of what Donald Trump represents, because we not only have solutions to these crises, we have the numbers that it takes. We don't need to be a movement that splits the vote. We could, in fact, actually flip the vote. There well, are. <clears throat> let me play an ad um, that Hillary Clinton has released. I believe tomorrow uh, Donald Trump will be releasing his first. Um, uh, we don't know exactly the role Roger Ailes is playing, famous for his advising George H. W. Bush, Reagan, and others. Um, we know um, what is said behind the scenes as he is helping uh, Donald Trump prep for the debate. But this is Hillary Clinton's ad that has been titled Role Models. It's about Donald Trump. I love the old days. You know what they used to do to guys like that when they were in a place like this? They'd be carried out on a stretcher, folks. And you can tell them to go themselves. I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody, and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? It's like incredible. When Mexico sends its people, they're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. You know, you could see there was blood coming out of her eyes. Uh, blood coming out of her, wherever. You got to see this guy. Oh, I don't know what I said. Ah, oh, I don't remember. He's going like I don't remember. Our children and grandchildren will look back at this time, at the choices we are about to make, the goals we will strive for, the principles we will live by, and we need to make sure that they can be proud of us. I'm Hillary Clinton, and I approve this message. That message. is uh, being seen as whether—whatever position you take is one of the most powerful in many years, Donald Trump, in his own words. Um, but it is a challenge to you. It's probably the most powerful challenge to third parties, is um, what Hillary Clinton is saying is, can we afford this? Is this who you want to be for our radio listeners? What they continually showed, as Donald Trump was saying those things, was children watching. The children are watching. Yes. And, you know, what this ad says is we must vote against Donald Trump. It doesn't tell us what we are voting for. And that's exactly the problem, that Donald Trump represents this right-wing extremism, this neo-fascism. That doesn't go away uh, by bringing in another set of neoliberal policies. Remember where this economic uh, crisis came from that is lifting up the uh, insecurity and the economic misery that undergirds uh, Donald Trump. This comes from the policies uh, that were led by the Clintons, by Bill, and advocated by Hillary, including Wall Street deregulation, including NAFTA and the offshoring of our jobs, including the uh, 1990s crime bill and the opening of the uh, floodgates to mass incarceration. The solutions that Hillary Clinton provides are more of the same. It will be more of that economic security and misery that feeds right-wing uh, extremism. This is not the alternative to Donald Trump. And we agree, let's not vote for Donald Trump, but let's vote for uh, a future that actually serves the needs of the American people. That won't come from a candidate like Hillary, who's sponsored by the banks and the war profiteers. Dr. Jill Stein and Ajamu Baraka, mm -hmm. Green Party, presidential and vice presidential nominees, I'd like to ask you to stay. We're going to